episode of The Dog Show features Mark Goldberg. Mark is co-author of the book The Art of Training Your Dog, a unique guide for gently teaching good behavior using an e-collar. This book introduces a breakthrough method in dog training. This method taps into a dog's ancient pack instincts while employing state-of-the-art technology and a game-changing tool, the remote e-collar. Mark has been training dogs for over 50 years and is a nationally renowned dog trainer. He's also the former president of the International Association of Canine Professionals. In the interview, we discuss all things dog training with e-collars, including whether or not they hurt dogs, the types of behavior you can correct by using one, and the brands of e-collar you should be looking out for. Mark Goldberg, welcome to The Dog Show today. Thank you very much for coming on. Well, thanks, Will. I think I found the right show to talk to. Uh, absolutely. We we're just talking before we, we jumped on the call that um, it's the afternoon for you in Chicago and for me in Sydney, I'm just starting my day. But what a better, what a better topic to start the day on, chatting to a dog trainer across the other side of the world. <laughs> well, I'm pleased. To, I'm definitely happy to be with you guys. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, it should be a bit of fun today. Um, we're, we're going to be discussing, as you mentioned, quite a controversial topic. We're going to be talking about e-collars for, for training dogs. I'm quite interested to find out more about it because I'm a little naive in, in the space. Um, and I'm sure there's lots of questions that all the listeners have as well. But before we jump down that path, um, I just want to hear a bit more about you. So tell me about, um, you've got your own dogs, I believe. You've got three of them. I do. I've got three dogs. I have uh, two of them are 16 years old. And let me tell you, that's a challenge. Oh. They've both gone a little bit deaf. Um, so it's, uh, it's a relief that I taught them hand signals back in the day. And so I can still communicate with them. But I have a little 16-year-old rat terrier, which is sort of like a Jack Russell, except for they don't bite people. <laughs> that would okay. be the primary difference. And then um, I have a 16-year-old Border Collie Pit Bull mix, I think is his mixture. A very, uh, uh, and he's got the best of both breeds. He's got the, the, the very affectionate nature of the Pit Bull and the, the very athletic uh, intellect of the Border Collie. So he's just a lovely boy. And, um, but they're elderly now. And I have a three-year-old German Shepherd named okay. Friday, because that's the day we got her. <laughs> very nice. <laughs> so have your, your two older dogs started to slow down a little bit? When, when did that start happening? Well, you know, I started to notice it when they were 13 or 14 years old. And actually, um, I, I haven't needed to go to this method yet, but it, it has happened to me in the past. If I, if I get a dog who goes, who, my dog, who goes completely stone cold deaf, utterly completely deaf. When they're younger, I do train them with e-collars and the e-collars that I train with, among other things, can vibrate like a cell phone set to silent, you know, and someone calls you, it vibrates in your pocket. And um, so um, my last German Shepherd, when she went completely deaf, she, she would never know when she was outside if I wanted to, her to come back in the house. And I live on a beautiful little farm. It's all mm. fenced in. So, you know, at night I might let them you know, go out for their potty for, you know, 10 or 15 minutes. I'm close by, but I could always just call her on her cell phone. If I wanted her to come <laughs> back, I would just ring the pager and she would trot back happy as a clam, but she, she couldn't hear me, but she could feel me. That makes sense. Um, yeah. So when did you, have you, did you get your dogs from shelters or breeders or had, what, what was that choice? Well, um, you know, I'm, I am definitely not against the breeding of well, put together dogs. Somebody mm. has to make more dogs and somebody should be doing it, not just randomly, but with, with, with forethought, with care to improve the genetic selection of the breed, which is what the monks of Nuski do with their German shepherds. But as it happens, my three dogs are all rescue dogs. The, um, the rat terrier, um, her owner uh, passed away when she was very young and they needed to find a home for her urgently. Mm. So I, I took her, I said, I'll train her and then I'll find her a home. Cause I'm not a rat terrier, little dog kind of guy. And you know, like two weeks later, that was my dog. Yeah. <laughs> so we call that a foster fail. And I, I kept her, um, the border collie. Um, I, I was looking for one and, and he was perfect. So I fished him out of a shelter and the German shepherd, She's a very well-bred dog. I trained her for a client. I liked her a lot. And then they had some problems at home. I could not keep her. So they called and asked me to find her a home. And I did. It, it was my home. She never left here. So yeah. I just I, got lucky that way. 
Yeah, I guess living on a farm, you, you wouldn't traditionally think of a farm dog being the smaller rat terrier dog. It's the collie, the body collie cross and yeah. the German Shepherd make a lot of sense though They with the open spaces. Well, I'll tell you what though, if you go back in history, at least on American farms, probably mm. the same is true for Australian farms, every farmer had two or three of those little ratting dogs. And the reason is they all had, and still do on the sheep units, they've got grain. And when you have grain, you have rats. And when you have rats, you have spoilage. So um, all the farms had these little dogs that could just whip through the barn, find the, find the varmints and wipe them out. So they were very utilitarian dogs. Less so today. Today, we just keep them because they're clever and cute. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, especially the ones that are in the city because <laughs> they're, not, they're not chasing rats. <laughs> exactly. Well, American cities, there's probably more rats in American cities than there are on the farms these days. Yeah, exactly true. yeah that's probably right. Um, so, Mark, you've been dog training for over 50 years. You've, had a, you've got a huge history working with dogs and living with dogs. What got you into dog training? Like, What, what, what attracted you to it? Well, I was a child bride to this industry, and, um, and I, I tell that story in, in my first book with the monks of Newski called Let Dogs Be Dogs. And what had happened was um, when I was a youngster, I desperately wanted a dog. It took me a, a lot of begging and pleading over a year, but I did, I did get a puppy for my 11th birthday. And uh, let me just, before I tell you this part of the story, I will tell all your listeners that this dog lived to a very ripe old age. I mean, I got him at 11 and he lived till I was almost 30 years of age. But when, uh, when he was only five months of age, he ran into the street, was hit by a car. He was badly banged up. And so uh, once we got him patched up and surgeried all together, when the cast came off, the pins came out, my mother did a, an amazing thing that just changed the course of my life. And that is she sent me and that dog to dog school. Because she said, if you don't train him, he's going to get killed on that road that we yeah. lived on. And um, the rest was really a bit of history because, well, to make a long story longer, I was the only little kid in that whole class. There must have been 25 adults in that class. But my little Gus and I, we won the first prize. So I was kind of <laughs> hooked from that. I was kind of hooked. And um, I'll tell you what, it wasn't long after, maybe only two years later, that I was obsessively reading everything I could find on dog training. And that can seem to concern the librarian in my middle or junior high school, as we call it here. And um, so I would have been about 12 or 13 years old at this time. And, and she, she, she queried me on why are you reading all these books? Like, but it's only dog books. And I, and I told her that I wanted to be a dog trainer. And uh, then the next thing I knew, she called my mother, who apparently gave permission for me to go home with the librarian and train her dogs. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. That was a different era back in the 70s, right? You could just go home with your teachers. Right. <laughs> and uh, and I'll, I'll, here's the end of the story. She gave me $5 for that hour. And mm. uh, that, that was a significant amount of money in that era. I'll tell you that. It was a lot of money. So um, I, 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 I scratched my head and thought there might be something to this. And that was <laughs> that's how I started. You were flexing that entrepreneurial muscle at a very young age then by the yeah, sound of like 12. <laughs> It's an, amazing, it's, it's an incredible thing when you discover your passion, your drive, your identity, you know, at a young age, because they say it takes 10,000 hours mm. to become unconsciously competent at a thing. And um, it probably took me 20,000 hours because I wasn't that good at it, mm. you know, at, at first. But I, I had the time I was young and I devoted all the, the time and energy in the world to it because I wanted to understand. It wasn't so much that I wanted to make dogs do things. For me, it was never about being in control of a robot. Mm. What really, really drove me then and drives me today is to understand what are they thinking? Why do they do what they do? What do they need from us? How can we be better friends to our dogs? How can we make them happier and how can we keep them safer? Mm. So that was really it for me. Well, you're very fortunate to have found your passion at such a young age. I, it certainly took me a lot longer. I'm <laughs> probably another 20 odd years until I was... Um, down the dog path, but <laughs> um, you're very lucky to to have spent so long working in this space. I agree. I think it was a stroke of luck, but you know, better late than never. Welcome, to, welcome to the party. It's, <laughs> it's a, it's, it is a great way to make a living, and you and you meet some wonderful people. Also, mm. it's not just about the dogs. This is a helping profession. We help people. If things are out of sorts with the dog, the whole home environment is usually messy and upsetting. So I, I really think we help people and families. 
Um, interesting. I was looking at the photos on your website and you've got photos of so many different breeds of dogs that you've trained. Yeah. You know, I noticed there's a French bulldog bang in the middle because I have a French bulldog. Ah, uh, they're so cute. Yeah. But you have, you know, there was poodles. There was all sorts of different yeah. dogs on there. Do you have any insights on how hard it is to train different breeds or is there any breeds um, that are harder to train or is it more about their kind of upbringing and that kind of stuff? I think it, it helps if you know sort of like the genetic makeup of a breed, like what drives them, what motivates them, what do they want. Um, and I, I, for, for example, a lot of people, a lot of dog trainers or even owners don't like training. Let's, let's just take beagles as an example. Um, they find them obtuse thick-headed, stubborn. But I don't think that's fair. I think we have to remember what the beagle was bred to do. The beagle was bred to have the most, one of the most incredible noses on earth, right? And um, what they want to do is they want to utilize it. So when I train beagles, all I teach them is I will trade you a sniff for where the raccoons and the rabbits pee in return for a recall and just the basic obedience so you don't get killed out there. Mm. And once they understand that you are the great hunter, that you know where all the good stuff is, and that you will reward them with what they most want, the right to be a beagle, the right to use that nose, but that it's a partnership and you have to do it together. They give you whatever you want. Um, and the same is true of huskies, for example. A husky, a husky wants to run. I mean, they are just bred with an incredible amount mm. of drive they're bursting with energy and they want to run. And people say that it's impossible to train them uh, to off-leash reliability and safety. But that's poppycock. I've trained dozens and dozens of them to it. But what you, you, you don't take the running out of them. Mm. All you teach them is run this way. Now, come on and let's run that way. Now run to me. Here's your treat. Run that way. You just teach them where to do it and how to turn. Mm. and had a recall because if you think about it the huskies were bred to pull sleds in alaska but some of them must have come home at night or there wouldn't be any anymore <laughs> so it's yeah. a highly highly trainable dog uh, you know the the french bulldogs are bred for selective hearing and i'm i'm sorry for the french you know the the members of the the the, the french public in the, in the audience <laughs> you know but the french are very discriminating in terms of what they will eat and who they will make friends with but um, what I have noticed is the average French bulldog will will sell his soul and you for a, a, a treat or a squeaky toy because they, they tend to like both. So you just need to engage the mind of the dog. And so I, now I, I don't think there's a stupid breed. I think that um, you just need to understand what they want and trade them what they want for what you need from them. Yeah, my French bulldog certainly will take attention of any kind. So <laughs> um, it's interesting though. So it sounds like what you're, you're saying is you've really got to understand maybe the history of the dog, but also the dog itself and just harness, harness its, its innate kind of um, tendencies rather than trying to stop yeah. them. Well, listen, it's a lot easier to, to swim with the tide mm. than against the tide, right? Mm. So if you, um, if you understand what a dog wants, what a dog needs, how to communicate to that dog, it's a lot easier to convince them that they should try the behaviors that you're offering them. And uh, we built a lot of that kind of, a lot of that kind of um, hypothetical thinking. There's a lot of that uh, appeal to the nature of the dog and the instinctive nature of the dog. In fact, in, in our book, The Art of Training Your Dog, yes, we teach you know our readers how to teach their dogs obedience, but it's, it's all framed up in ways that work to harness the instinct of, that the dog has to please, mm. uh, to, to please their owner in the first place. And when you, when you work with a dog, well, let me phrase it like this. Training is not something you do to your dog. Training is something you do with your dog. And if you do it with that thought in mind, everybody's going to have a good time as opposed to just, you know, getting bossed around. Nobody wants to be bossed around a lot. No. Um, okay. So you, it's a good segue there. You mentioned your book, The Art of Training Your Dog. For many, many years, uh, you trained without e-collars. And then at, some, at yeah. some point in time, you changed your methodology to start using an e-collar. What, what was that reasoning and, and kind of how did you go on that journey? Well, I was actually very anti e collar, but that was based on my early experience in the 70s. Hmm. Um, and, and the reason is, is that e collars were around even back then. They were, you know, I think they go back at least into the 60s, but they were big and they were ugly. And, and I put one on me back in probably 1972. I'm for reference, guys, I'm 62 years old. And so back when I was a kid in you know, 1972, I put one of these on my hand. 
Um, and I pushed the button and it, and it almost knocked me across the room. Mm. I mean, it was brutal. What did they use them for back then? Well, in this country, as probably in your country, it was then and in certain parts of the country still is legal for a farmer to shoot and kill a dog that's harassing livestock. So, for mm. example, if you had a sheep killer, that dog was going to get killed. Even if it was a sheep chaser, someone was going to kill your dog. Um, so it could be used for breaking uh, you know, habits like that. But that was all it was good for. It certainly wasn't good for any kind of meaningful training on a dog that you, you, know, that you loved. Mm. Um, and therefore, all my opinions about that were based on that thing that I knew. Now, also at that time, I was writing. I always loved to write. And I started out by writing longhand. And then eventually I got a typewriter, which you probably, you know, you probably so young, you didn't even remember a typewriter. I mean, you literally clicked, you know, click, 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 click. And then uh, things got really fancy and I got an electronic typewriter. Um, so you didn't have to like slam the carriage over. You just pushed a button. Well, I guess what I'm saying is now I have a computer. Mm. Technology advances. It, it doesn't hold still for anybody. And um, technology in training collars in electronic training collars is the same thing it miniaturized it got better are all the collars electronic collars out there today good are are they all good no most of them most of them are not good mm. most of them i wouldn't put on a dog i disliked okay but there are a handful of of companies who have devoted millions of dollars in research and development money to produce um e-collars or electronic collars that you can put on your hand and push the button and feel it over and over and over and over and 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 detect it but not be upset or, or worried about it and uh, that offered a lot of opportunity to dog trainers but i guess the hard part then was to figure out how to use the technology good technology if it's not matched with good methodology you got a problem and uh, that was the problem that we find that we put ourselves to solving was to figure out okay Back in 2000, companies started coming out with really unique, amazing new equipment, but we nobody knew how to use it well. And that was the that was the challenge that the monks and I faced was to decipher that and decode how can we use this stuff better. Okay. Before we jump into your methodology, I want to I want to talk a little bit more about the e-callers. So, how do they? I, what I understand is there's a, a grading system or something. Is there? Um, like there's a, a one level shock, and and then ah, is that is that how it works? Well. Okay, so first, let's distinguish between what is a shock collar and what is an e-collar. Okay. The um, and, and and bear in mind, guys, I'm not an electrical engineer. I'm I'm a, a simple dog training author. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but I will tell you this: there are there's certain cheap collars where the electricity passes through you, mm. but then there are there is other ways to transmit electricity, like what in this country we would call a TENS unit, which is a transcutaneous uh, method of passing electricity. So for example, I'm sure they use them in Australia as well. You, you hurt your neck, so you go to the doctor or the physical therapist, they put some pads, electrical pads, like EKG pads on mm -hmm. your neck. They feed low level electronic stimulation into your neck. You can barely feel it if they keep it at a low level. And, but what it's doing is it's, it's gently massaging the muscle Mm. which brings extra oxygen to the muscle, which is therapeutic and healing, okay? So there are some of the e-collar manufacturers have figured out how to engineer their collars to do exactly that. And at the lower levels, you find, you, you know, if it's on your fingertips, you feel a, a light tingle. If it's on like a muscle, you know, you, you feel a very low, low twitch. That's what, we're, that's what we're after for the dogs. Um, we don't want to pass electricity through their body because mm. that's really unpleasant. Um, that's a taser, example, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, listen, when I was a little kid, um, I don't know why, but I was bound and determined what, to figure out what made the light bulb go. Okay. And my mother constantly was stopping me from, from playing with the light bulb in a lamp. Mm. But one day she took her eyes off of me. I unscrewed the light bulb, put my finger in the lamp and I found out, okay, <laughs> what makes, the, what makes the, what makes the light bulb go. And I never did it again. That electricity passes through you. It travels mm. up the arm. It's very, it's decidedly unpleasant. Here it's 110. I don't know what it is by you, but it was it's not nice. Yeah. E-collar, it's not like that. It's just going, uh, you know, it's going a few millimeters into the skin. That's all. 
I had a similar experience as a kid. It wasn't an electrical one, but my mum kept telling me, don't touch the stove, don't touch, touch the stove, it's hot. But I, as soon as she left the room, straight onto the stove. <laughs> right there. <laughs> you certainly learn quickly by doing that. But um, So I guess with these e-collars, what I, this, you mentioned that you put it on your hand and you're comfortable with putting it on your hand. Would you put these collars on your neck and be happy that they weren't going to hurt you? Yeah, of course. I mean, look, the, let's start with the following stipulation. Guys out there, if you're worried that, you know, I don't want to hurt my dog, this, 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 this sounds, you know, sketchy mm. or questionable. Um, I don't blame you for, for, for wondering that, but let me assure you, in the book, we talk at great length about how to select a high-quality e-collar, number one. And number two, we talk at great length about how to use it. Because it's a it's a it's a nuanced conversation. You really need to know what constitutes a, you know a really uh, unusable e collar. Hmm. What constitutes a good one? And then once you've got a good one, how do you use it to uh, engage your dog, to to teach your dog that it means excuse me, I want to talk to you about something. And and as often as anything else, it means I've got a treat for you. Give me some focus. Come here and get your treat. Um, but I mean, if you punch me and then give me a twenty dollar bill. I won't enjoy the punch or the $20 bill, right? But if you tap me on the shoulder and go, here's a 20, if it's a light touch, yeah, I'm going to engage and be happy. And so will a dog. So there's a lot to know about this, but mm. I guess I would sum it up like with, with the following thought. Concern and controversy and distaste for electronic collars. It's understandable, but it's based on outdated equipment and outdated methodology. We got the new stuff for you and it's really good. So I guess you've convinced me that I think what needs to be done if you're going to start using an e-collar for training is to do your research into the actual product you're getting, um, speak to trainers that have used them um, or read your book, for example, and really understand what you're getting yourself into and how to use it properly uh, before going down that path. I think that would, for me personally, as a dog owner, that would make me feel more comfortable about using something like this. That's absolutely critical. You're so right. Look, here um, in North America, manufacturers believe that approximately 1 million units are being sold per year. Mm. Some of them good, some of them not good. Uh, the Monks and New Skeet and myself, we both run board and train programs. So I, among the things that I, I do, Zoom consultations for clients, so they could be anywhere in the world. But my local market, people in the Midwest of the United States, they bring me a dog and they come pick up their trained dog a few weeks later and learn how to keep it trained. And um, some of them actually bring along an e-collar that they have purchased over the counter someplace at a store. And almost universally, they tell me, you know, I tried using it and then and I gave up quickly mm. because I upset myself or I freaked out my dog. Or when I opened it and started to read the instructions, I got scared because it really didn't inform me what to do, how to use it. Mm. So a lot of people buy them and then realize I'm in over my head. <laughs> and um, sometimes those are good e-collars and we can use them. Other times we tell them to return them and we'll supply a better one. But always you need education. Look, you can buy a kid a car, but you better teach them how to drive it before you mm. just hand them the keys. And this is a lot like that, I think. Well, I think that's the same with many training methodologies for for dog owners. I mean, you've got the dog owner needs to be educated and trained themselves for the for the actual training to work, right? Well, always, always that's true. Yes, but I think it's probably even more important when we're talking about power tools, mm. right? Um, you're, you, you, a leash is a really important tool, but there's probably a limit. Unless you're a, brut a brutal, terrible person, there's a limit to how much damage you're going to do to a psychologically to a dog you know, with a leash. You'd know you were messing it up, and ideally you'd stop and seek assistance, right? But with an mm. e-collar, you know, there's buttons, and you need to know what you're doing. Mm. The advantage of it, though, here's the advantage of it. I I've been training dogs a very long time. And I trained dogs for many years before I would ever want to use an e-collar because they were no good. Mm. Um, and I taught dogs to come when called, even if there was a squirrel. And a lot of people have done that. You know, it's, it's, I'm not the only one. I didn't invent that. But let me tell you what. It took about 25 weeks of training on the average dog to really get a dog reliable around heavy distractions for a recall. 25 weeks. 20. Yeah. And you needed to train that dog approximately an hour a day in two half hour segments, at least five days a week. So count up the hours in the week. Most people never did that. Hmm. And consequently, most dogs never really fully became reliable. We're doing it now in two or three weeks, hmm. 
two or two or three weeks, right? And by the way, I want to stress this with dogs who enjoy the process because we've built it into their instinctual behavior and we've made it fun for the dogs. So the, the timeline is so much better now. It is not trained with fear. It's trained with joy. That's really what we want to, what we want is we want dogs who enjoy the training. I definitely think that acceleration aspect is in terms of accelerating the process uh, is a very attractive part of it for me because I know that where we've fallen over in the past trying to train our dog to do certain things is just that discipline and, and um, patience of doing it over and over again over a period of time, right? I have, a, I have an incredible amount of patience with dogs, but it seems like I focused it all in that area. <laughs> you know, for, every, for everything else, I'm a disaster as far as patience goes, right? But for, but for that, and I think the reason that I've cultivated the, the ability to really focus on getting the best out of the dog is, is because I know it works. And, mm. and I also know it's the only thing that works is for you to be fair and patient and consistent and to read the dog well. Know when to know what you know what I have the battle of a of, of a dog training session is knowing when to stop, right? Um, more is not better uh, mm. in, in a lot of cases. So in, in the art of training your dog, I would say most of our lessons are anywhere between five to fifteen minutes. Um, mm. We want to keep them brief and punchy and happy and leave the dog wanting more rather than wanting less. Okay, so in the art of training your dog, um, your book, it's basically a step-by-step guide from what I understand of yeah. how to use e-collars to, to gently teach good behavior to dogs. Um, and you, yeah. re- you recommend a process for finding the right e-collar, all that kind of stuff. But what does your methodology look like? How, how do you teach a, a dog to do something using an yeah, e-collar? So, yeah, no worries. So, well, first, what we do, I've told you we're, that the monks and I in our professional programs are teaching all the way up obedience and you know good behavior, manners, problem solving from uh, soup to nuts in roughly three weeks. Mm. In the book, we decided to slow it down a little bit because we're professionals. Like we, we just do this all day, every day. Mm. So we know what we're looking at. In the, in the book, what we did was we came out with a daily planner. It's, it tells you what to do every day for six weeks. At the end of six weeks, you'll have a fully trained dog. And by fully trained, I mean a dog you can go hiking with off leash someplace where it's reasonably safe. You know, don't, I wouldn't do it down, down the middle of a divided highway, right? But you could go into off leash safe areas, play with your dog and know if he scares up a rabbit, you'll get him back readily. Mm. Um, a dog who will go to bed, lay down when asked and, 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 and so forth. So we start out by introducing the, um, uh, the training collar and we merely teach the dog that this little tap on the shoulder, this little funny feeling that's unimportant. It's so low what we're shooting for. We call it the educational level, by the way, is a sensation delivered to the dog that he will feel as though somebody tapped you on the shoulder. And just as we do that, what we do is we turn around and walk the other direction. In fact, we start training indoors. We start training in the house because there are fewer distractions in the home, number one. And also a lot of people struggle with bad behavior in the house. Mm. So it's a really good way of starting low key, gentle, easy training. And all we do is we walk them from one end of the house. And just as the dog is going to pull ahead of us, we tap the button and turn around. There's pictures of this to make it clear what to do. Actually, there's a couple hundred color pictures in that book. But the essence of the thing that we, we start with is the button has one very simple significance. Tap on the shoulder means, hey, buddy, we're turning the other way. And um, ultimately, then we can teach the dog now it has other contexts. We can pair the tap with the, com- with the command that you've pro- the dog probably already knew for sit, but we use, we use help to help mold the dog. We're, we're never yanking or cranking on the dog at all. We're never cranking up mm. the collar and saying, do it or I'll make you sorry. Never. Mm. It's a question of helping the dog achieve it and understanding the tap from the e-collar means listen to the word now that we've put a word to a command and do the word. And there's a food treat. And in fact, well, let me show you my little Murphy here. Here's Murphy. Right. <laughs> so uh, we, we put a food treat right to his face and help him help him to sit. So the food treat is a cue that we want the dog to sit. The word is a cue. The lifting of the treat is a cue, all to help the dog sit. But so is the tap of the button. Hmm. The value of it is, is that we can use it eventually from from a a distance. So if we want a dog to sit 30 or 40 feet away from us, you know, we can just tap and tell him and he'll do it. And eventually we can eliminate the tap because the e-collar is a tool 
to be used and then eventually faded back way back. Yeah. So I think that language you use is very helpful in the sense that rather than saying things like shock, you say, you know, light sensation. Um, I think that helps yeah. me understand kind of what the, what the process looks like as well as um, talking about the tap on the shoulder um, rather than, you know, what people might associate with the old e-collars. Um, well, if you see your dog, if I may, just let me put this out there. If you push a button and you see your dog jump, or exhibit any sign of discomfort, you're doing it wrong. Yeah, <laughs> and we can and we can help you with that. That's not what we're after. Well, I guess that's the um, the technology equivalent of like hitting them or something, right? If that that end of that's the right. spectrum, which is yeah. not not a good Absolutely. training methodology either. So, um, so right. what I'm hearing is if if I get your book and I use that to try and train my dog, I'm looking at a six week kind of process. Starts in the house, slowly build up to to eventually be using the e collar in, in in a more kind of open environment. Does that sound like a good summary? Or absolutely, yeah. We start we start in the house, hmm. uh, and what we what we begin to teach in the house are are good leash manners. We we start teaching sit in the house, and then we move quickly to sit at the doors because a lot of people have the problem that children open the door and the dog bolts out. Now they're chasing the dog down the street. Um, or the pizza delivery guy is there and now the dog's gone, you know, ape, ape at the door, excuse me. So we teach sit, we teach sit at the door to lower door frenzy, teach the dog. It's a control point. Um, and then we begin teaching the recall or the come when called the come command. We teach that we start that in the house too, but we are simultaneously advancing to teaching leash manners, then outside recall outside, sit outside, even when there's distractions. And then we take our six foot leash and we turn that into a 15 foot leash which mm. is uh are you guys imperial or metric uh metric but that's, so that's okay with, go with anything <laughs> yeah. well we start with a two meter leash but we work our way up to a five meter leash mm. and um so that and and eventually by the way that five meter leash we let go and it's dragging along the ground um and uh you, you know within a reasonable amount of time if you haven't had to chase the end of that leash to step on it and stop your dog you can take it off Hmm. Or we talk you through how to use a lighter, longer leash, but eventually to eliminate it. So it's a very careful sequential progression from training with a leash in your home to training with a leash outside where there is a higher, slightly higher level of distraction to doing all the same stuff, but on a very long leash just for safety and control until you both get your sea legs and your bearings. And then, and by the way, a dog who is psychologically connected to you, you know it. He notices the bird, but he doesn't stare at it. He checks back to make sure you're still coming. So it's, when we decode it for you, it's very easy to know if your dog is, um, is plugged into you psychologically. And then eventually there's no leash at all. The mark of any dog training system, in my opinion, and the opinion of the monks and Uski, it's it, it's multifaceted. Does it help eliminate conflict from your life? Do you have to? Can you stop nagging your dog? Number mm. one, but number two, does it does it grant liberty to your dog to be a dog? You know, to run, to play, uh, to be able to do that outside where it's you know, legal and safe and sane to do it. Go to the dog park, go to the beach. You know, they, they need that, but they need it from a position of safety. So does the dog training system get the dog off leash reliable quickly and happily uh, around distractions? If not, then I don't really know what you're accomplishing. That's what we want anyway. I think that's a great point. And something that I would resonate with is you, can, you want your dog to have some freedom and to really go and enjoy things. But if you're worried or anxious that they're going to have bad behavior in that scenario, then you kind of yeah. just restrict them from doing that. And then... You're not happy. They're not happy. Um, so being able to teach them better behaviors in, in those environments would be very, very good. Yeah. I, we, we really want you to be able to take your dog to the beach, to the cafe, mm. to the woods. We want, we want your dog to be able to go hiking with you. The, the key point is, is that what you got a dog for was companionship. You know, mm. you didn't get him to lock him up. Mm. Um, the, the problem, of course, is here's where at least many, Ameri where many Americans, I think, go wrong. And that is they immediately, they, they adopt a, a dog and they immediately want to jump to being that that dog's grandparent, Yeah. you know, but, but you got to be the parent first. You got to teach them to stay out of jail, you know, before you can just rile them up and take what you need out of the dog. You know, they they have rights too. And one of their rights, in my opinion, is education. And here's why your dog wants to go with you. Hmm. And, um, if he's, if you don't trust him, if he's naughty, then he's going to spend his life locked up. And that's, that's, that's sad. You know, if you train him, you can take him with, and that's what he really wants. So what type of, we've spoke, you've spoken about those kind of core 
commands such as sit, stay, recall. Is that is that the I guess the essence of being able to correct bad behaviors as well? Uh, yes, I'm so glad you phrased it that way. Uh, the, I think it's very unfortunate if people want to jump to, well, let me start over. The average client who comes to me for the boarding school, they usually don't come saying, listen, I just want a beautifully trained dog once in a while. But usually it's not that. Usually it's like, look, man, this dog <laughs> eats off the counters. He knocks over the kid. He growls at the mailman. He like He's scratching my back door when he wants to come in. Uh, I, I mean, the list goes, he steals laundry. He doesn't come when called. He's got selective hearing. I've got potty issues. I mean, <laughs> when you hear this list of stuff, it sometimes makes you wonder, why do people get dogs? You know, it's <laughs> yeah. Incredible. The amount of awful things they can do. They dig holes. I had a dog, I had a client dog who, who in one afternoon when he, when he left the dog in the fenced in yard, pulled $25,000 U.S of landscaping right out of the ground, including the entire sprinkler system. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's amazing what they can do. So, but, and we, by the way, there's an appendix in the back of the art of training your dog, which lists 45, the, the 45 most common problems we ever hear, which includes that list I just gave you and a whole bunch more. But what you started by saying was if you train your dog, <clears throat> is that how we approach those things? The answer is you bet. I mean, we don't start by punishing a dog for bad behavior. First, we teach them the rules of civilized behavior. Mm. So if you train your dog, and we say this repeatedly in the book before the problem section, which we put on purpose, we purposefully put that section in the back. If you train your dog, the number and intensity of problems you have, they're going to dissipate or disappear, but they're for sure going to de-escalate, mm. decrease. And the reason is, the vast majority of naughty dog behaviors, th those are caused by boredom and frustration, which is what untrained dogs usually suffer from. And then all that creative energy has to go into something and it, it's going to be something bad. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you educate your dog and spend quality time with her, then she will be less bored, less frustrated, and probably you'll see a big decrease in problem behaviors. But if you still have them, we got your solutions. Makes sense. And I think as well, um, you know, bad. I, I certainly look at bad behaviors as, as it's my fault. I, I haven't given them the, the tools they need to make the decisions that I want them to make in those in those scenarios. So, um, well, you know, most of us most of us feel vaguely guilty if we raise the kids wrong. <laughs> exactly, it's never too late. Never too late. That's part of the problem when you're out and about. It's um, and people see your dog doing bad things. It kind of makes you uncomfortable, right? But. Anyway, imagine, imagine being a dog trainer and your dog is naughty. So uh, <laughs> you really have to train your dog so that, you, you know, you're, you're not embarrassed to give out your card. That's, that's comforting to know that maybe even a dog trainer's dog will have um, bad behavior sometimes. So. <laughs> Listen, let me tell you, no, no dog is perfect. Mm. And by the way, no dog should be held to accountable, you know, for a, 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 per, a perfect score. They're living, breathing beings with rights and emotions and desires and stuff. So I look at it like this. I want a, a partnership with my dog, but I want to be the senior partner. I want 51% of the corporation. And the reason for that is I know what's safe for him in a way that he does not know. But other than that, no, nobody's perfect and uh, neither am I. So <laughs> I, don't, I don't mind a little bit of shenanigans on the part of my dog. I just want him to be safe. So do you have a brand of e-collar that you recommend or that you use for, for training? Well, we show, uh, we, we talk a lot about that in the book and I can mention some brands here, but um, you got to look at the individual models and I recommend that you don't just take these, this little component of this interview. This is for the guys out there and, uh, you know, listening to this and just run with it because there's a lot mm. more to know than just this, but there are some really good brands um, that I'm very familiar with. One is called e-collar technology Another one is called Dogtra. Mm -hmm. Another one is called Big Leash. Another one is Garmin. And then also there is the, um, the Sport Dog uh, brand. So th that group, and, and there are probably others that I'm accidentally omitting, and if mm. so, I'm sorry. But the, the, those brands have many models that fit the bill for what we're looking for in an e car that can be used gently. Okay. Well, thanks for sharing that. So where can people find out more about the book? Theartoftrainingyourdog.com, I believe, is the best place to go. Uh, 
and they can also check out yeah. your website as well. Yeah, my 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 business website, my private personal business website is chicagodogtrainer.com or theartoftrainingyourdog.com where you can learn more about both me and the monks and of New Skeet and the book. Perfect. Well, I'm excited to to start diving into the book. It got released last week, I believe, is that right? It did. It just started shipping recently and and we're really thrilled it's uh it's the number one new release uh, in dog training on amazon here in the states and uh seems to be getting some good reviews that you know but we're, we're we're happy to have it in the world we put a lot into it but the the idea really was to help people and dogs that was the goal well that's exciting and thank you so much mark for coming on the dog show today i i had a really good time i learned a huge amount about e-callers but also just about understanding my dog and understanding that you know the process of of training a dog to to have good behavior by by using an e-collar and, and just you know using a good mindset so thank you so much for sharing your expertise with the listeners well thank you for having me i really enjoyed our time